Hitler's right-hand man, the deputy Fuhrer who believed that thoughts could move objects and that Britain would make peace with Hitler. Hess somehow is really a myth. Rudolf Hess is undoubtedly one of the, one of the most interesting historical figures of the, of the 20th century. Rudolf Hess was on a ride that ended in a spectacular fall. He rubbed shoulders with the Nazi elite, yet abandoned the Reich at the height of its power on a secret quest to strike a deal with the enemy. If Hess would have succeeded, this is absolutely clear, the whole course of the war would have been different. Hitler's deputy flew a grueling, dangerous, thousand miles secret flight to Britain in the middle of the Blitz. He would spend the rest of his life behind bars, the last inmate in Spandau prison. An old man pacing the yard alone. Mystery and intrigue continues to swirl around his life and death. How you know, can a man of that age you know, commit suicide? Um, many believe he didn't, that he was, he was murdered in order to try and stop secrets that he might have. He died more than 25 years ago, and yet his name is still celebrated by a hateful, racist and violent minority. Rudolf Hess is revered by neo-Nazis as a martyr, as a so-called peace aviator. There are rumors that his flight to Scotland served to end the so-called brother-on-brother war with England. As such, he is an old-time Nazi character who fits perfectly into today's neo-Nazi ideology. This footage was secretly recorded at underground neo-Nazi concerts in Germany and Austria. If I had been discovered with my hidden camera, I would most likely have been beaten up by many of the Nazis. And it's not impossible for you to end up beaten to death. It's the kind of intimidation and violence committed by Nazi thugs in the 20s and 30s. And Rudolf Hess was one of them. Hess, of course, played a part. He, if he didn't organize violence, he certainly knew about it and tolerated it. Rudolf Hess was a devotee, one of the first to join the party. Anyone who looks at the film of him can see this glowing fanaticism and total adoration of Hitler that Hess displays. It's almost frightening how much one man can adore another man for political reasons. The party is Hitler! Hitler aber ist Deutschland, wie Deutschland Hitler ist! Hitler! He was also the man who, who really promoted this idea that Hitler was more than just a man, that he was a man um, brought to Germany by providence, by fate, uh, to achieve greatness. Like Hitler, it was in Munich that Hess became engulfed in the politics of racism and violence. But it wasn't on the streets but in university lectures that a key future Nazi policy took shape in the mind of Rudolf Hess. The idea of Lebensraum, or living space, was brought in through Hess from his teacher at university, Karl Haushofer, who was a geopolitical theorist. Now, Lebensraum doesn't mean, or didn't mean, the idea that the Germans are so squashed up together and there's so many of them uh, that they need more living space. It's a specific doctrine which Hitler then developed on the basis of Haushofer's theories, that Germany has to conquer living space in Eastern Europe. Hitler turned it into this aggressive, murderous policy of exterminating the Slavs. Hess was one of the first of millions enthralled by Hitler's theatrical rants. Like Hitler, he was born in a foreign land. From Egypt, the wealthy merchant's son was sent back to Germany and rode into radical politics. You find in the early 1920s all kinds of far-right-wing groups are emerging in Munich, holding meetings as a ferment of, of ultra-right anti-Semitic politics. Rudolf Hess followed Hitler everywhere, including prison, 
when they were jailed for attempting to overthrow the government in 1923. They were undoubtedly very close. I mean, remember, they, they shared a cell when Hitler was, um, was writing Mein Kampf. You know, Hess was effectively his secretary and by all accounts did a lot of the typing. Some people argue he did some of the writing too. He carried out his orders absolutely slavishly. People in the party mocked Hess as the brown mouse, you know, because he was so, you know, so devoted and would scurry anywhere at Hitler's behest. But there was another side to the brown mouse. SS stormtroopers raided the home of his old university lecturer, Karl Haushofer. His wife, Martha, was considered a half-Jew. Their salvation was recorded in the family diary. Their powerful friend, the deputy Führer, intervened and forbade any more raids on the house. He was a friend of the family. And every time, every time, he was really always helpful. And yet, Hess could be ruthless. He played a key role in Hitler's bloody crackdown on Ernst Röhm and his SA brown shirts. When Hitler had the leaders of the brown shirts, the stormtroopers, shot, arrested, he'd arrested the chief of the stormtroopers, Ernst Röhm, who was getting too big for his own boots, put him in prison. Hess offered to shoot him twice. He said, it's me, I have to do the shooting. The first concentration camps and so-called Jewish ghettos were established when Hess was deputy. Segregation and the stripping of property and human rights would eventually lead to the industrial murder of millions in the death camps. Anti-Semitism, the idea of getting rid of the Jews somehow by pushing them out of Germany, by making life unbearable for them there, eventually during the war, by exterminating them, was absolutely central to National Socialism, and Hess shared that in full measure. He was undoubtedly anti-Semitic. Um, he was uh, helped draft uh, the race laws. The race laws signed by Minister Hess banned Jews from official jobs and from marrying other Germans. All the leading Nazi figures made exceptions. Goering, for example, his brother saved Jews, and Goering knew that. Um, Hess, for example. When it involved friends of his, he made exceptions. Two key friends of his, Karl Haushofer and his son, Albrecht Haushofer. Um, Karl Haushofer was married to a, a woman who was half Jewish. It made his children quarter Jewish, which meant that they were subject to the race laws. Hess issued so-called writs of protection for them. and gave them an exemption, effectively branding them honorary Aryans. Yet it was the same man who urged the Nazi mob to swear allegiance to Hitler at mass rallies. The other interesting thing about Hess was, after Kristallnacht, when um, there was so much violence against Jewish businesses, Hess issued a, a, a statement and issued an order that there was to, to be no more looting of Jewish shops. Rudolf Hess became mired in party politics, managing regional leaders, issuing orders, and punishing transgressions. But keeping in step with the Nazi hierarchy was vital, even for someone as powerful as the deputy Führer. Maintaining Hitler's favor was a balancing act. Hess was sidelined, other cronies rushed in to take his place. Hitler was the center of the power. Once you lost that relationship, the game was over. There was a rivalry, I mean, and they always tried to get the access, the, the special access to Hitler, to the Führer. Hess was out. While the keen amateur pilot indulged his love of flying, 
his Führer was pursuing a different passion. Hitler had his sights set on war. The only flying he was interested in was the kind that would bomb the rest of Europe into submission. Himmler and Goering were saying what Hitler wanted to hear, while faithful party comrade Hess was bothering him with petty politics. He had been viewed as Hitler's right-hand man during the rise of the, of the Nazis, uh, but when war broke out, that position had really been, been taken away. Hitler famously said that when he spoke to Goering, he said he, feel, he felt like he had been bathed in steel, um, that he made him feel so good about himself. And then he said that, that with Hess, all he brought to him was problems and troubles. Hess became very deeply upset when he began to realize he was being sidelined in the decision-making process. By 1939, Hitler had left his deputy behind. Rudolf Hess developed a range of ailments like stomach cramps and palpitations. As war loomed, the deputy Führer was in the background. By 1939, Hess' times was definitely over. I mean, he had no influence on military affairs and foreign affairs, on domestic politics. The deputy Führer became withdrawn. He was a minister without portfolio and had no specific job. Rudolf Hess walked a lonely path, immersing himself in alternative therapies and the paranormal. He is devoted to bizarre practices. He is devoted to quasi-medicine, uh, bizarre diets. And he's not alone. In some ways, that sums up the entire Nazi elite. They are surrounded by irrational charlatans. Hitler's washed-up deputy turned to alternative therapy. He'd welcomed delegates to an international conference on homeopathic medicine. He believed that electrical currents could revive him. The Austrian clinic that Hess visited is still sparking today. A thank you note from Hess for the regaining of my health still survives. It was around this time that the deputy Führer's bright idea took shape. He would reach out to Britain, make peace and re-establish himself as a bright spark in the Nazi elite. It's interesting to see and, and, and when the war started in September 39, he was still the third person of the state. So Hitler announced officially, when I'm going to be killed in this war, Goering will be my successor. And if Goering will be killed, Hess will be his successor. So, so theoretically, Hess was quite important. So was in the inner circle. But in praxis, he was not. Hess plotted a course that would place him back at the heart of Hitler's inner circle to negotiate a deal with Britain. But was he working alone? The British army in France was hopelessly surrounded at Dunkirk when Hitler suddenly ordered a halt, allowing it to escape. Was this part of secret preparations for an Anglo-German pact? There's no evidence that there was any deal in preparation between the British and the Germans at the time of Dunkirk. The real reason why Hitler stopped the troops while the British got away was because Goering had assured him that the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force, would destroy the British troops on the beaches. And there were long arguments between the generals who uh, wanted to regroup. In fact, Hitler and his generals were planning an invasion of Britain. Hitler, um, I mean, had the hope to come to a separate peace with, with Britain in, in summer 1940. But after that, he realized, no, I mean, we have to wage a war, possibly not too harsh, but somehow a war to somehow persuade Britain um, to make peace. So, yes, we have to bomb Britain. But the blitz that wore on day after day, night after night, only hardened British resolve. Churchill has no interest in peace with Germany 
at all. Churchill believes that Britain is going to win the Second World War. He already has plans about how that's going to happen. I suppose there are two elements to those plans. One is an alliance with the United States, so you have a global coalition of the two most powerful democratic nations fighting Germany. And the second is the belief that the British war machine can, in fact, generate enough military power to defeat Germany. Warned that his official country residence at Chequers might be bombed, Churchill held several war cabinet meetings at Ditchley Park in leafy Oxfordshire. By that time, the Luftwaffe was losing the Battle of Britain. Hitler called off his planned invasion, and time was on Churchill's side. If you are confident of victory, why would you be interested in peace feelers? In particular, uh, Churchill and those around him believe that Germany has to be utterly defeated. After his revival at the Austrian clinic, Hitler's deputy was fired up in the belief that the time was ripe to force Britain to make terms by himself in secret. I think there was a crucial period um, in end of May 1940 where um, Churchill's position as the Prime Minister was not secured yet. But once this period was gone and, and they reached June, they reached July 1940, there was absolutely no um, possibility of an understanding with Britain. So all these hopes then uh, in 1941 from, from, from Hess and even before, this was just an illusion. Rudolf Hess turned to people he could trust. Albrecht Haushofer, the son of his old friend and university lecturer. Albrecht Haushofer had a possible contact for Hess. Someone he would go on to believe could have influence in government and high society. A Scottish aristocrat and fellow aviator, the Duke of Hamilton. The Duke's son, James, wrote a book about the extraordinary events that unfolded. Albert Heisser had explained to Hess that he did not think the British would respond to any peace overture because he said the British regarded Hitler as Satan's representative on earth who had to be fought. Yet Hess was still convinced the Scottish peer was his man and finalized the plan to fly to his estate. Hess's view was incredibly naive and very simple. In his mind, he would fly over to Scotland. He would meet with the Duke of Hamilton, lay out his proposal, and the Duke of Hamilton would round up the great uh, landed gentry of, of, of Britain, and together they would go en masse to the king, explain the situation, explain the error of Winston Churchill's ways, and the king would depose of the prime minister, put a new man in charge, who would then do a peace deal with, with Germany. That was his concept of how this mission would roll out. The reality of it was, was so far from what, he'd, what he hoped. The deluded deputy Führer didn't have an influential contact in Britain, but he did have a plane. The shrewd manufacturer, Willy Messerschmidt, was more than willing to do him a favor. If Hess would have said, boss, give me um, a fighter, yes, of course, when he's the minister, really Messerschmitt knew when I have to contact the leading, some leading figures of the state, which is important for me because I want to make money. Hess was the deputy Führer. Very few people would say no to the deputy Führer if he had a request. Messerschmitt won lucrative military contracts through close relationships with senior Nazis like Hess. But there may have been another reason why the canny aircraft manufacturer was so willing to accommodate the deputy Führer's wishes at his factory and airfield in Augsburg, Bavaria. He owed him. He owed Hess a favour. Because in the 1930s, the local town council decided that Messerschmitt's factory would be the perfect place for a tram depot. The plan was that it would be taken over and trams would, would, would end up there. And it was Hess who was one of the people who insisted that, um, it, that it, it stay in place. This was the machine that could get Rudolf Hess to Scotland. The sleek, powerful Messerschmitt BF-110 fighter bomber. Most were destroyed in the war. This one survives in a Berlin museum. 
When he realized, during a visit to Augsburg, that the Messerschmitt 110 was equipped with two additional 900-liter tanks, he realized this could be the ideal aeroplane for me. He also needed specific radio equipment. The Messerschmitt 110 had enough room for this radio equipment, and he knew that he could reach England in this plane. Mit diesem Flugzeug könnte ich nach England fliegen. Wenn jetzt nur eine Person flog, when you had just one person flying the plane, a few alterations had to be made. The radio equipment is very important for a flight over long distances and had to be operated from the front seat. So they had to install a kind of operating frame to the front, so that the equipment could be controlled from there. With Hitler busy preparing for the invasion of the Soviet Union, the deputy Führer could indulge in his passion for flying, planning and taking training flights without raising suspicions. He researched the route. Um, he did all he could in order to get information about the weather reports and uh, weather systems. Hess made his first attempt just before Christmas 1940. Three times he took off for Scotland, but was forced to turn back to Augsburg. He had a number of attempts, um, but had to turn back through mechanical problems and, and issues to do with the weather. Probably the only other person in his entourage who knew about his peace flight was his trusted adjutant, Karl Heinz Pinch. The deputy Führer dictated the deal he believed would lead to Britain's capitulation. Hess believed he was offering a very generous deal. The deal was that, uh, that Britain could keep most of its colonies, but the key point was that Germany would have total dominance of Europe. But the British government were aware that, um, that any deal with Hitler would basically involve his boot on your throat. Misinformed and misdirected about the enemy territory he was heading for, the deputy Führer pushed on regardless. He made his last speech at the factory from where he would take off. In front of a BF-110, the same model Willy Messerschmitt gladly gave him to fly, unaware that he'd never get it back. Nine days later, Hess was back at Augsburg with his trusted adjutant. In case of capture, he would fly under the alias of Captain Horn. Interception by fighter planes from both sides was a real risk. Hess had to be aware of the, of the dangers um, of his flight. It was an exceptionally difficult flight to pull off. In fact, afterwards, when Hitler was told about it, he asked um, the Luftwaffe, is this possible? Can Hess pull this off? And they assured him no. Hundreds of German bombers also took off on the 10th of May, 1941 but they weren't carrying offers of peace. London suffered one of the most savage raids of the Blitz. Well, the, the, the reality is that bombing makes people extremely angry, and there couldn't have been a worse time for any Nazi leader to launch a peace initiative. Palpitations. As war loomed, the deputy Führer was in the background. By 1939, Hess' times was definitely over. I mean, he had no influence on military affairs and foreign affairs, on domestic politics. By 1939, Hitler had left his deputy behind. Rudolf Hess developed a range of ailments like stomach cramps and palpitations. As war loomed, the deputy Führer was in the background. By 1939, Hess' times was definitely over. I mean, he had no influence on military affairs and foreign affairs, on domestic politics. The deputy Führer became withdrawn. He was a minister without portfolio and had no specific job. 
Rudolf Hess walked a lonely path, immersing himself in alternative therapies and the paranormal. He is devoted to bizarre practices. He is devoted to quasi-medicine, uh, bizarre diets, and he's not alone. In some ways, that sums up the entire Nazi elite. They are surrounded by irrational charlatans. Hitler's washed-up deputy turned to alternative therapy. He'd welcomed delegates to an international conference on homeopathic medicine. He believed that electrical currents could revive him. The Austrian clinic that Hess visited is still sparking today. A thank you note from Hess for the regaining of my health still survives. It was around this time that the deputy Führer's bright idea took shape. He would reach out to Britain, make peace and re-establish himself as a bright spark in the Nazi elite. It's interesting to see and, and, and when the war started in September 39, he was still the third person of the state. So Hitler announced officially, when I'm going to be killed in this war, Goering will be my successor. And if Goering will be killed, Hess will be his successor. So, so theoretically, Hess was quite important. So was in the inner circle. But in praxis, he was not. Hess plotted a course that would place him back at the heart of Hitler's inner circle to negotiate a deal with Britain. But was he working alone? The British army in France was hopelessly surrounded at Dunkirk when Hitler suddenly ordered a halt, allowing it to escape. Was this part of secret preparations for an Anglo-German pact? There's no evidence that there was any deal in preparation between the British and the Germans at the time of Dunkirk. The real reason why Hitler stopped the troops while the British got away was because Goering had assured him that the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force, would destroy the British troops on the beaches. And there were long arguments between the generals who uh, wanted to regroup. In fact, Hitler and his generals were planning an invasion of Britain. Hitler, um, I mean, had the hope to come to a separate peace with, with Britain in, in summer 1940. But after that, he realized, no, I mean, we have to wage a war, possibly not too harsh, but somehow a war to somehow persuade Britain um, to make peace. So, yes, we have to bomb Britain. But the blitz that wore on day after day, night after night, only hardened British resolve. Churchill has no interest in peace with Germany at all. Churchill believes that Britain is going to win the Second World War. He already has plans about how that's going to happen. I suppose there are two elements to those plans. One is an alliance with the United States, so you have a global coalition of the two most powerful democratic nations fighting Germany. And the second is the belief that the British war machine can, in fact, generate enough military power to defeat Germany. Warned that his official country residence at Chequers might be bombed, Churchill held several war cabinet meetings at Ditchley Park in leafy Oxfordshire. By that time, the Luftwaffe was losing the Battle of Britain. Hitler called off his planned invasion, and time was on Churchill's side. If you are confident of victory, why would you be interested in peace feelers? In particular, uh, Churchill and those around him believe that Germany has to be utterly defeated. After his revival at the Austrian clinic, Hitler's deputy was fired up in the belief that the time was ripe to force Britain to make terms by himself in secret. 
I think there was a crucial period um, in end of May 1940 where um, Churchill's position as the Prime Minister was not secured yet. But once this period was gone and, and they reached June, they reached July 1940, there was absolutely no um, possibility of an understanding with Britain. So all these hopes then uh, in 1941 from, from, from Hess and even before, this was just an illusion. Rudolf Hess turned to people he could trust. Albrecht Haushofer, the son of his old friend and university lecturer. Albrecht Haushofer had a possible contact for Hess. Someone he would go on to believe could have influence in government and high society. A Scottish aristocrat and fellow aviator, the Duke of Hamilton. The Duke's son, James, wrote a book about the extraordinary events that unfolded. Albrecht Haushofer had explained to Hess that he did not think the British would respond to any peace overture because he said the British regarded Hitler as Satan's representative on earth who had to be fought. Yet Hess was still convinced the Scottish peer was his man and finalized the plan to fly to his estate. Hess's view was incredibly naive and very simple. In his mind, he would fly over to Scotland. He would meet with the Duke of Hamilton, lay out his proposal, and the Duke of Hamilton would round up the great uh, landed gentry of, of, of Britain, and together they would go en masse to the king, explain the situation, explain the error of Winston Churchill's ways, and the king would depose of the prime minister, put a new man in charge, who would then do a peace deal with, with Germany. That was his concept of how this mission would roll out. The reality of it was, was so far from what, he'd, what he hoped. The deluded Deputy Führer didn't have an influential contact in Britain, but he did have a plane. The shrewd manufacturer, Willy Messerschmidt, was more than willing to do him a favor. If Hess would have said, boss, give me um, a fighter, yes, of course, when I mean, he's the minister. Willy Messerschmidt knew, I mean, I have to contact the leading, some leading figures of the state, which is important for me because I want to make money. Hess was the deputy Führer. Very few people would say no to the deputy Führer if he had a request. Messerschmidt won lucrative military contracts through close relationships with senior Nazis like Hess. But there may have been another reason why the canny aircraft manufacturer was so willing to accommodate the deputy Führer's wishes at his factory and airfield in Augsburg, Bavaria. He owed him. He owed Hess a favour. Because in the 1930s, the local town council decided that Messerschmitt's factory would be the perfect place for a tram depot. The plan was that it would be taken over and trams would, would, would end up there. And it was Hess who was one of the people who insisted that, um, it, that it, it stay in place. This was the machine that could get Rudolf Hess to Scotland. The sleek, powerful Messerschmitt BF-110 fighter bomber. Most were destroyed in the war. This one survives in a Berlin museum. When he realized during a visit to Augsburg that the Messerschmitt 110 was equipped with two additional 900-liter tanks, he realized this could be the ideal aeroplane for me. He also needed specific radio equipment. The Messerschmitt 110 had enough room for this radio equipment, and he knew that he could reach England in this plane. Mit diesem Flugzeug könnte ich nach England fliegen. Wenn jetzt nur eine Person flog, when you had just one person flying the plane, a few alterations had to be made. The radio equipment is very important for a flight over long distances and had to be operated from the front seat. So they had to install a kind of operating frame to the front so that the equipment could be controlled from there. With Hitler busy preparing for the invasion of the Soviet Union, the deputy Führer could indulge in his passion for flying, planning and taking training flights without raising suspicions. He researched the route. Um, he did all he could in order to get information about the weather reports and uh, weather systems. 
Hess made his first attempt just before Christmas 1940. Three times he took off for Scotland, but was forced to turn back to Augsburg. He had a number of attempts, um, but I had to turn back through mechanical problems and, and issues to do with the weather. Probably the only other person in his entourage who knew about his peace flight was his trusted adjutant, Karl Heinz Pinch. The deputy Führer dictated the deal he believed would lead to Britain's capitulation. Hess believed he was offering a very generous deal. The deal was that, uh, that Britain could keep most of its colonies, but the key point was that Germany would have total dominance of Europe. But the British government were aware that, um, that any deal with Hitler would basically involve his boot on your throat. Misinformed and misdirected about the enemy territory he was heading for, the deputy Führer pushed on regardless. He made his last speech at the factory from where he would take off. In front of a BF-110, the same model Willy Messerschmitt gladly gave him to fly, unaware that he'd never get it back. Nine days later, Hess was back at Augsburg with his trusted adjutant. In case of capture, he would fly under the alias of Captain Horn. Interception by fighter planes from both sides was a real risk. Hess had to be aware of the, of the dangers um, of his flight. It was an exceptionally difficult flight to pull off. In fact, afterwards, when Hitler was told about it, he asked um, the Luftwaffe, is this possible? Can Hess pull this off? And they assured him no. Hundreds of German bombers also took off on the 10th of May, 1941 but they weren't carrying offers of peace. London suffered one of the most savage raids of the Blitz. Well, the, the, the reality is that bombing makes people extremely angry, and there couldn't have been a worse time for any Nazi leader to launch a peace initiative. Hess took off in the afternoon and didn't turn back. His fourth attempt would be a marathon feat of navigation and flying skill. In some sense, it's really a miracle that he reached Scotland. I mean, he had no navigator in, in, his, in his plane, um, and it was quite a, quite a demanding flight in, in terms of navigation. It took him five and a half hours to reach the Scottish coast and the deadly threat of British air defences. It's often reported that Hess got a free pass, that um, no fighters were sent up to intercept him, that people turned away when the, the plane entered British airspace, but that's not the case. We know that it was recognised, it was tracked. We know that Spitfires were sent up. According to one account, Hess saw Spitfires on his tail before he bailed out. He'd almost made it to the Duke of Hamilton's estate and parachuted out near the rural village of Eaglesham. Nobody expected it. Literally, Hess drops out of the sky, and the British are utterly confused about what's going on. It takes them some time to actually be clear that it is Rudolf Hess. A young boy kicking a football with his dad that evening is one of the few eyewitnesses still able to tell the compelling tale. We suddenly heard the sound of a, a German plane coming from the east back here. And it was unmistakably German because we knew the sound of the unsynchronized engines. Uh, my father shouted, it's a Jerry. And I, I was mystified. Anyway, the plane passed over this huge tree, which was then here, and went exactly in that direction. So this is the very spot where Rudolf Hess landed. And his plane crashed only a very, very short distance away. 
uh, from there. He was seen by ploughman in the cottage, which is just here, and the ploughman, David McLean, and his friend John Tweedy came out of the house and helped to release Rudolf Hess from his harness and helped him into the cottage. Meanwhile, meanwhile shouting to the owner of the farm, we've got a German prisoner. Hess fell short of the Duke of Hamilton's country estate. His Messerschmitt was wrecked, but he escaped with an injured ankle. The mystery pilot, calling himself Captain Horn, was taken to the local headquarters of the Home Guard, now a Masonic hall. My father went into this room where the prisoner was in bed, and he explained that uh, I don't know whether you recognize me, but I am Rudolf Hess, Hitler's deputy. I'm, I'm on a personal, unauthorized mission of humanity. And of course, my father was absolutely astonished. Uh, he had not expected the prisoner uh, to be a person of any great seniority, uh, but uh, it was quite clear now that uh, this man was probably Rudolf Hess because Albrecht Haushofer had described Hess to him as a man with eyes sunken into his head and a dark, swarthy complexion and the prisoner uh, expression, demeanor and looks answered that description. It was Hitler's deputy and he would soon find out how wrong he'd been. The Duke of Hamilton was not a conduit to some kind of pro-German anti-Churchill alliance in Westminster. The Duke of Hamilton had the shame in many ways of, of having the, the deputy Führer believe that you were the man, the go-to man, um, to organize peace with, with Britain. The deputy Führer did not get the welcome he expected. Churchill had just visited London streets, bombed to ruins by Nazi raiders. He was at the Ditchley Park country estate when the Duke of Hamilton told him who had dropped out of the sky. Do you mean to tell me that the deputy Führer of Germany is in our hands? And he looked at my father as though he was having hallucinations and the war had been too much for him. And my father said, that is who he said it was. And Churchill replied, well, Hess or no Hess, I'm going to see the Marx Brothers. I think he meant it. He'd arranged to go and see a funny movie, and what could he do at that point about Hess? Was it to be taken seriously? Clearly not. And it was a way of Churchill actually saying, I'm not going to pay any attention to this. This is not serious. We are not going to take this as a way of making peace. British views on peace with Germany, they don't want it. In Churchill's view, in the view of his government and in the view of most of the British people, there are only two types of good German, dead or groveling. The Hess episode was a four-day wonder in my father's life, but it was a great shock to him because he was not the equivalent of Hess in Britain. He was a wing commander, a station commander, who was very busy fulfilling his duties uh, in the Second World War. Hitler had been busy planning a surprise attack on the Soviet Union. Surely a deal with Britain would have suited him, saving him from a war on two fronts. Perhaps he had known about his deputy's bizarre plan all along, and even sanctioned it. That's exactly what Rudolf Hess's adjutant told Soviet interrogators after he was captured on the Eastern Front. But his version was recorded under pressure possibly torture. When Karl Heinz Pinch was eventually released, his hands were so disfigured he could no longer hold a knife and fork. He really suffered, clearly, uh, while in, in Soviet captivity. So we do not know exactly what happened to him, but it's very, very likely that they at least, to put it politely, put uh, very much pressure on him. I think um, it's very unlikely that he really said the truth. Once he was out of German airspace, Hess had ordered his adjutant to report his mission to Hitler. According to the 28-page report he wrote for his Soviet interrogators, Hitler was unsurprised and reacted calmly. But others at the Führer's mountain retreat at the time 
had a very different version of events. Hitler was shocked and reacted <laughs> with fury um, and, and outrage. People said Hitler was crushed. They'd never seen him so upset. But why would the Soviets force Pinch to say otherwise? Historians suggest Stalin wanted evidence of a possible Anglo-German deal to discredit and put pressure on the West. Hess and his unfortunate adjutant became pawns in a geopolitical game. It was quite clear that Pinch delivered what the intelligence authorities wanted to hear. Stalin, for his part, wanted to sow doubt and dissension in the West. He always had this lingering feeling that because the British and the Germans are both capitalists, they somehow would make a separate uh, deal between themselves. But there was no deal. And the Nazi propaganda minister had a PR disaster on his hands. The Führer's deputy had landed on the enemy's lap. Hitler's loyal party comrade was suddenly branded a deluded fool. The idea that they eventually had, pushed by Goebbels, the propaganda minister, of proclaiming that Hess had gone mad, of course, wasn't actually a very favorable comment on the nature of their regime. The Germans in Berlin, who kept on inventing these wonderful jokes, well, imagine Hess is brought before Churchill, and Churchill says, so you're the madman. And Hess says, no, I'm only his deputy. <laughs> The regime did not tolerate being laughed at. Those associated with the deputy Führer paid a heavy price. Der Führer hat sofort angeordnet, dass die Adjutanten des Parteigenossen Hess verhaftet wurden. The unfortunate adjutant Karl Heinz Pinch was arrested and kept in solitary confinement before being sent to the Eastern Front in 1944. Rudolf Hess's part Jewish friends, the Haushofers, were exposed. Their writs of protection now carried the signature of a traitor. It was the beginning of the end for Hess's old university lecturer, Karl Haushofer, and his son, Albrecht. Albrecht supported the resistance against Hitler and was executed in 1945. His father, Karl, and half-Jewish mother, Martha, committed suicide a year later. As for Rudolf Hess, there was no meeting with the king or influential politicians. He was locked away in the Tower of London. The Soviet Union was not yet in the war. Perhaps Hess was silenced in a bid to provoke Stalin into action. So it's a way of Churchill just keeping the lid on Hess, not allowing to say anything, dropping a few hints that there was a separate peace being negotiated and that would prod Stalin into invading Germany before Britain pulled out. If you let Hess say something, you could see that he was bonkers and the whole plot would be completely unraveled. From the tower, Hess was incarcerated in more opulent surroundings a country house to the west of London. He's an interesting freak, as far as the British are concerned. Uh, they want to prod him. They want to analyze him. They want to understand what's going on, which led to this utterly bizarre incident. Churchill didn't need Hess to stoke unease in the east. Six weeks later, Hitler invaded the Soviet Union and the Führer's former deputy was all but forgotten. That was the best it was ever going to get for, for Rudolf Hess, um, in a country house where he got to walk around the grounds. It was also the scene of a first attempt at suicide. He survived a leap from a first floor with a broken leg. In his suicide note, he declared his loyalty to Hitler, even though the regime considered him a deluded traitor. After his Führer's crushing defeat, the die-hard Nazi was hauled before the International Criminal Court at Nuremberg. It seemed that Goebbels was right after all. Party member Hess seemed to have lost it completely. At Nuremberg, he pretended to be suffering from amnesia, 
But when the commandant challenged him with behaving in a not very manly fashion, and he owed it to his family and to his country to make a clean breast of it, he next day he stood up and said his memory was responding perfectly, and he wished to stand trial with his colleagues. He was sentenced to life in prison for his role in the early crimes of the Nazi regime. The Holocaust was revealed to the world, yet Hitler's former deputy still declared himself a proud Nazi. Ich bereue nichts. Rudolf Hess was sent to Spandau prison on the outskirts of Berlin. Fellow inmates, like Hitler's architect, Albert Speer, and the Hitler youth leader, Baldur von Schirach, came and went. The former deputy Führer was there to stay. Compared to a normal prisoner in a normal prison, he had considerable freedom of movement, a choice of food, and that sort of thing, which a, a, a prison, a normal prison, would never get. And so he had quite a free life within those confines. He was remarkably fit for his age. He was kept there because that was the sentence. The sentence was a life sentence. There was a campaign to free him, but it was a neo-Nazi campaign. Had he been released, he would have become the center of neo-Nazi adulation, uh, not to mention, of course, the adulation of old Nazis who still looked to him as a deputy for the Reich. In June 1987, the West German president made a historic visit to Moscow. An apparent thaw in relations led to speculation that the Soviets might agree to release Rudolf Hess. Yes, I told him, and he said to me, that's good. Others refute the idea that Russia would ever agree to release the unrepentant Nazi who was once Hitler's deputy. Why would Russia not want him released? I think the answer for that is that, um, look at the death toll of the Second World War. Look what it inflicted um, on Russia as a nation. It, it was vast. On the 17th of August, 1987, Hitler's former deputy sought his own final release. Hess's suicide was a total surprise. There was no indications leading up to it whatsoever. Hess was found in the prison's summer house. Officials claimed the frail, partially blind 93-year-old hanged himself with an electrical cable. A child could have done it, really. It was just one over knot. It wasn't uh, any, anything elaborate, just a twist in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the cable. There were no witnesses. But conspiracy theories emerged that Hess was assassinated to stop him revealing embarrassing secrets. His carer claimed to have seen two suspicious people standing over the body. They were standing there like murderers, very relaxed, so not like actors, but really like proper professional killers. There's no reason why anyone should want to kill Hess at all. He was an old, isolated, lonely man. Um, there was no hints anywhere during all the decades that he was in Spandau prison that he was going to reveal any secrets of any sort. Hess's son, Wolf, was among those who suspected foul play. The family ordered a second autopsy. And the question was, is hanging or strangulation a viable theory? An important aspect of this question is the so-called rope mark. The report came to the conclusion that the death corresponds to the compression of the neck through a rope-like implement. The report did not voice an opinion whether this was down to hanging or strangulation. The second autopsy sparked more questions than answers. Some body parts were not available for the private examination. The so-called neck entrails, 
including the larynx, the windpipe or large parts of it, the thyroid gland and a carotid artery. They were all missing. The body parts weren't missing. There was a logical explanation. Those parts wouldn't have been given to the family at that stage because they still hadn't been finished being examined. That type of examination is, takes days and uh, we certainly wanted to get rid of the body. So we handed it back. Rumour and speculation followed Rudolf Hess in life and death. The second unofficial autopsy was inconclusive. Conspiracy theories of murder were very much alive. The family believed that this was a death resulting from strangulation by a third party. But we had to say that that is one possible scenario, but not necessarily the correct one. For prison authorities, there was no mystery surrounding the death of Rudolf Hess. I think these other uh, theories, etc., are absolute rubbish. Anything else is pure speculation. Hitler's former deputy died knowing he would never be pardoned. And he realized from the rejection note coming back from authorities that there was no chance of him being released. He was there for life and that was it. And he realized that and accepted it this last moment and said, well, I'll do something about it and did it. His ill-fated flight led to a life in captivity. Death was the only release. He is still celebrated by an extreme minority, ignorant of the terror he once represented. There are two points which should never be forgotten about Rudolf Hess. The first is he signed all the anti-Semitic legislation. So he helped provide a framework in which those of Jewish origin could be openly discriminated uh, against. And the second uh, point about him is that he supported uh, Hitler in word, uh, thought and deed, and that he did not want peace. He wanted war against Russia, but what he did want in order to make that war successful was Britain to be removed from the conflict before the onslaught on Russia began. And in that, he failed. His deluded flight to Britain was not made to serve peace, but Hitler's ambitions for total war. Both were a spectacular failure. Micoza. Nu permiteți unghiilor dumneavoastră să se deterioreze. Exilor penetrează complet unghia cu rezultate vizibile pentru unghiile noi crescute. Exilor. Pentru informații suplimentare, adresați-vă medicului sau farmacistului.